Now we begin some of the nitty gritty parts of microbiology. If you're watching these videos or taking our course for fun and not as a medical student, this might be a little more depth than you need to know. However, if your curiosity is piqued, and I hope it is, allow me to introduce you to some of the finer points of medical micro. A lot of this is going to sound like gibberish at first, but with a little acclimation, you'll become quite familiar with these terms. It's also mandatory for the USMLE and other medical boards. We return to our good friend Staph aureus. It's a bit of a beast with all the unique features this promiscuous bug has, but that works to our benefit, all the more ways to identify it and separate it out from the rest of the pack. First, let's look at the lab tests we can perform on this microbe. As briefly discussed in our first tier video for this module, Staph aureus is a catalase positive bacterium that allows it to escape from the immune system. Catalase positive microbes can cause a disease known as chronic granulomatous disease. By breaking down peroxide, a chemical used to destroy invading bacteria, staph can defend itself from the caustic materials. However, it also has another powerful enzyme called coagulase. Usually in the coag cascade, fibrinogen breaks down to fibrin, but the coagulase prevents coagulation and trapping of the microbe. Both of these enzymes can be tested for as well. Please see our linked videos in the recommended video section. The coagulase test results in bubble formation from the release of gas. Staph aureus is also beta-hemolytic. This means it is a complete hemolysis, but more on this later. Staph has enough odd ways to distinguish it from other bacteria. We talked about the Nikolsky sign seen in desquamation skin infections, such as scalded skin and toxic shock syndrome, but the super antigen was not discussed. Protein A sets off an atomic bomb of an inflammation within the body compared to other bacterial antigens. This is why such a severe reaction can be seen. Specifically, protein A is a C3B, or complement 3, inhibitor, and binds to the FC portion of immunoglobulins, as seen in the image. Note this protein's association with Staph aureus. We'll cover a few other proteins that you'll need to memorize that are specific for strep. If you ever see a question stating salmon-colored sputum, think about this bacteria. You and I may never see this, I couldn't even find a good image of it, and you never want to make a diagnosis based on this, but for testing questions, they love to add this in sometimes. Like all staph, staph epi also has catalase. None of the other species in the genus Staphylococcus that we will discuss have coagulase. So we have a culture taken from a patient's infected fluids. We stain the sample and look under the microscope and see gram-positive spheres in clusters. What else can we test to determine which bacteria it is? Hemolysis and antibiotic sensitivity testing are a great way to distinguish between different species in the same genus of bacteria. In this image, we can see the different types of hemolysis in an agar plate with bacterial culture. Also, it will become difficult to remember, but there are three antibiotics used, at least for medical course questions, that need to be memorized. Novobiosin, bacitracin, and optogen. Please do memorize which bacteria is resistant or sensitive to which test. Lastly, if you have a patient that has been in the hospital bed for a few days, there's a good chance that they may have needed a urinary catheter, or more intense, catheters directly into the venous or arterial blood supply. In a case question asking about the cause of a catheter infection, this should be high on your list of suspects. The last of the staph, staph sapro. Of course, we have the normal staph catalase present, but also here we see urease. As briefly mentioned, this enzyme breaks down urea into ammonia, leading to potential kidney stones. So how do we distinguish this bug from the previous staph? Here we see again a gamma hemolysis. I wish they would just say non-hemolytic as it'd be less confusing, which doesn't help us if we think it might be staph epi or staph sapro. This is where the antibiotic sensitivity comes in. Unlike staph epi, this bacteria will resist the antibiotic novobiosin it will not form a clear zone around the pill, as seen above, as a medicine kills the nearby germs. Interestingly, many Staph aureus species also produce novobiosin. It is thought this antibiotic might be used to kill off Staph epi, allowing Staph aureus to dominate the area. Guess it just has to live in harmony with Staph sapro, when it decides to travel south of the border, that is. Strep pyogenes is a group A strep. It is also beta-hemolytic, or completely hemolytic, caused by the release of the streptolysin enzyme. It also has some other interesting proteins that can be tested for as well. So if a patient comes in with vague sick symptoms and we run a blood test, we would see gram-positive cocci in chains, and we need to figure out which antibiotics are best to treat with. 
We can set off for a culture and hemolytic reaction, but that could take two to three days, and we need to treat right now. Unfortunately, Stan in the lab forgot to order the Lansfield reagent this month, so that test is out. But there's another enzyme we can check, this PYR enzyme, or pyridinyl aminopeptidase, also called pyridinyl arylamidase. That's my best guess. We use the PYR reagent, and if it changes color, then the enzyme is present. Okay, so this scenario doesn't really make sense. You would still need a culture and run the, to run this test as well. But hey, I don't work in the micro lab. Just trying to give you a scenario to kind of think of why you might use this. For the unique characteristics of group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, these particular toxins are associated with different diseases and can help identify the cause of related symptoms. This is why not everyone with a strep or staph infection has the same reaction or has all the symptoms listed. Different species and subspecies may hold different toxins, leading to different outcomes. You don't need to know what subspecies, thankfully, but remembering which toxins are related to GBS and that Staph aureus has its own distinguishing virulence factors will help to decipher on exams. Though less high yield, M-protein is an antiphagocytic virulence factor which prevents opsonization. Exotoxin A seen in scarlet fever, also called toxic shock-like syndrome, activates the immune pathways. ASO and anti-DNAs are antibodies produced by your body when fighting off a strep infection. High blood levels of these might detect a current infection. Group B strep has a few unique lab tests as well. The CAMP test, test for protein B, will show increased arrowhead hemolysis on agar. As we have seen, both GBS and group A strep are beta hemolytic, so that factor alone isn't enough to tell the difference between these two. Do you recall also which staph bacteria is beta hemolytic? If it is bacitracin resistant on sensitivity testing, then we can lean towards GBS. Interestingly, this is also the same antibiotic found in many popular topical ointments. Now, if your newly delivered patient shows bulging fontanelles, you may want to find out if the mother was tested for GBS before delivery and worry about meningitis. Finally, strep pneumo gives us our first glance at alpha hemolysis. This is a partial or green hemolysis caused by oxidation of hemoglobin to methemoglobin by bacteria. It is also non-typable by Lansfield, so it doesn't belong to a group like the others do. Often test questions will state this bacteria is lancet shaped under the microscope. I can't really see it, but think strep pneumo whenever you hear this. Also note that the salmon color sputum seen in Staph aureus versus the rust colored seen here. It's very easy to mix these up, especially when stress hormones are high, like during testing. IgA protease is an enzyme that breaks down a particular antibody in your immune system, IgA. This antibody, in comparison to IgG or IgM, for instance, is found primarily in the mucosa. This is just another way of saying throat, lungs, and GIT tissue. It now may make more sense why this infection leads to lung problems like pneumonia. Lastly, this is the most important encapsulated gram-positive bacteria we're going to cover. Although group A strep is also encapsulated, Strep pneumo is much more important to consider in asplenic patients, someone without a spleen, such as those with sickle cell that have gone through autosplenectomy. This is also a consideration when your patient has a splenic rupture, such as infection with mononucleosis, or no longer has a spleen due to previous trauma, such as in a motor vehicle accident. This is why teens diagnosed with mononucleosis aren't allowed to play contact sports. It can lead to splenic rupture. What can we say about viridin strep that hasn't already been covered? Fortunately, or unfortunately if you're cramming for a test, quite a bit. But let's keep it simple. This bacteria is also alpha hemolytic like strep pneumo. Optochin is the antibiotic that can distinguish between these two on sensitivities, as viridin is resistant. Also, unlike strep pneumo, this bug is insoluble in bile. So remember, optochin sensitive equals bile soluble, resistant equals insoluble might help keep it straight in your head. This is not likely to be clinically relevant to most learners, but it can be an extra point or two on an exam. Unfortunately, it's not always easy to visualize a biofilm, which is basically a slimy conglomeration of different microbes. They work together to protect and feed each other. Here we can see a soil crust, which is similar to a multi-species microbial community found in your mouth, only in soil. This is part of the reason we need to brush our teeth regularly. Immune cells can't always get past these slimy barriers to dislodge the offending bacterium. What about group D strep? 
Well, they are the biggest hodgepodge of medically relevant gram-positive bacteria in the category. They can be catalyzed positive or negative, any hemolysis type, and display some very interesting mixtures of features also found in other strep. This is one of the reasons why the Lansville classification is so important. So if we know a patient has a certain hemolysis, how do we rule in group strep? We could try to run the PRY or bile test, but this isn't the only pathogen that's PRY positive or bile resistant. Hemolysis doesn't help. If we don't have the Lansfield grouping back from the lab, and we're not quite sure about the patient's presentation, things can be a little difficult on this one. There are two other tests that we can try to perform though. Being salt tolerant, group D has the ability to grow in the presence of 6.5% sodium chloride, agar, or broth, salt. Salt is often highly toxic to many microbes, which is also why it makes a great preservative in foods. Also, group D streptococcus can hydrolyze esculin in the presence of bile. This can be seen on the agar slide turning black. So let's quickly sum up the massive amounts of information we have covered in this module. To distinguish between staph and strep bacteria mentioned in the module, we have several important tools and tests at our disposal. For antibiotic sensitivities, we have staph epi, sensitive to novobiocin, while staph sapro is resistant. With bacitracin, strep pyogenes, or group A strep, is sensitive, with group B strep being resistant. For optochin, strep pneumo is a sensitive organism, with viridins being resistant. The only coagulase positive germ we have to worry about is staph aureus, but with all staph species mentioned being catalase positive. We also see catalase in group D strep category. Here we're introduced to our first urease positive bacteria, staph sapro. The next few enzymes are unlikely to be seen again. There are only a few microbes that have developed a mutation for them. Though it's possible to see them for pathogenic microbes, only concern yourself right now with group A strep and group D strep when it comes to PYR positive bugs. The only camp positive test is for group B strep. Lastly, a way to remember group D strep is salt resistant is that it's commonly found in your mouth, despite the high salt intake of most Americans. If you appreciate the material we are creating, the best form of flattery is sharing it with your friends. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to our YouTube page, like us on Facebook, and bookmark our website as we continue to create and gather more resources for your use. Also, join our mailing list to be notified when our new course material is released. We'd also appreciate any feedback you might have to improve on future material and direct the concentration of future content.